Hello students, in our general medical practice, you know that fever is one of the common symptoms. And when a patient comes with fever, we tend to investigate, do certain routine investigations as a blanket way of analyzing or investigating a case of fever. When we ask for certain routine investigations, one of them is urine analysis or routine urine analysis. Another one being the usual blood count or complete hemogram. And today we will discuss about this urine analysis and I am Dr. Nandish from Bangui Medical College and Research Institute, Bangalore. The objective of this lecture would be to know certain normal and abnormal physical composition or properties of urine, to know the normal and abnormal chemical composition of urine, principles of some of the important chemical tests and the way of interpretation of these tests and also some of the fundamentals of microscopic evaluation and finally the clinical relevance and utility of these tests. The overall layout or the outline of this lecture would be to know the indications, collection and preservation, physical examination, chemical examination and urine microscopic examination. Now, why do you need to do urine analysis? means what information do you get from urine analyzing the urine? Urine analysis reflects the state of function of kidney and the urinary tract. Not only the kidney, it also gives information of the metabolic and systemic disorder in the body. And since it is a very simple and non-invasive procedure, it should precede all other invasive and non-invasive diagnostic investigations which are done for renal function. What are the overall indications for urine analysis? One is renal disorder as I mentioned earlier, plus you have, you can do for analysis of system kinase, systemic disorders, metabolic disorders and any case of hematuria or when you are suspecting urinary tract cancer or screening of patients exposed to cancer causing chemicals and for follow up of cancer patients. What are the types of samples you can get? It could be a freshly voided urine or the midstream urine. This is better because the initial portion of the urine may be contaminated with the, with the genitals and the later part could be contaminated with some 10 other secretions for example in males with prostatic secretions also. Or you can get this urine samples from a catheter like a condom catheter or a intrabladder catheter or it could be from a bladder washings, breast cytology. Samples of early morning specimens could be the best sample for evaluating the malignant cells. Now, what are the ways of collecting the sample? The best method is to collect in a clean, dry container, preferably sterilized or preferably sterile container, which is a wide mouthed container. Or you can collect using a catheter. For children, you can use a condom catheter or urine collecting bags. In rare situations, you can do a suprapubic aspiration of the urine from the bladder. Routinely, the first morning sample or the any fresh random sample is best for chemical analysis and for cas and crystals first morning samples is the best. Preservation. It is always best to examine immediately or do the test immediately that is less than two hours. If you expect any delay you can refrigerate it without adding any preservative or if you think that you have to transport or you have to keep it for a longer time then you can add preservatives like toluene, concentrated hydrochloric acid, thymol and formaldehyde. The examination of urine can be broadly divided into physical examination, chemical examination and microscopic examination. Physical examination includes certain parameters and even chemical examination includes certain chemicals to be tested and microscopic examination will have certain things to be examined which we will learn individually. So coming to the physical examination, we will take up individual physical parameters or properties. First one is the volume. Normally the range of volume excreted by a person in 24 hours would be somewhere between 600 to 2000 milliliters per day. On an average it is between 1000 to 1600 ml per day. In infants it is between 300 to 600. When it is excess it is polyuria, when it is less it is oliguria. Anuria is almost very less or almost no excretion of urea. So what do you understand by polyuria? Polyuria is nothing but excretion of increased volume of urine more than 2 liters per day. 
The causes of polyuria could be a physiological or pathological. Physiological is because of increased ingestion of fluid, a kind of psychological disorder where patient tends to drink as a compulsive disorder. Pathological. It could be due to diabetes mellitus, chronic renal disease, diabetes insipidus, where there is deficiency of antidiuretic hormone or diuretic therapy. A term called as nocturia can be used. A term called as nocturia is used. It means urine excretion of more than 500 ml in the night. Now coming to oliguria. Oliguria is decreased urine output less than 500 ml per day or per 24 hours. What are the causes? Restricted intake of fluid is you can consider it as a physiological cause or excessive fluid loss through extra renal channels like sweating, diarrhea, vomiting or due to reduced blood supply to the kidney so the kidney will not be able to function properly like in case of hemorrhage, dehydration, shock that is effective blood supply to the kidney will be there and so kidney will shut down and certain renal diseases like acute glomerulonephritis, acute tubular necrosis due to incompatible transfusion, remetal poisoning or crush syndrome. Addison's disease is an endocrine disorder associated with oliguria. Now, anuria means a severe form of oliguria that is excessive suppression of urine almost to less than 100 ml per 24 hours or almost less than 40 ml per 24 hours. This is mainly because of renal severe renal ischemia or total obstruction to the outflow of urine along the urinary tract either because of stones or tumors or due to a pathological change in the nephron a severe damage to the nephron. Now coming to the color. Normally urine is pale yellow or light straw or amber color fluid. The color is due to urochrome. There are certain various color changes depending on the compound excreted in the urine. Most of the times it is colorless. So colorless is a normal feature or a pale yellow color is a normal feature. When it is very much dilute as in polyuria it is usually colorless. Even you will not see pale yellow color also. When there is very much, it is concentrated or when it is very less like in oliguria, urine will be very concentrated, so it may look darker, little darkish brown also sometimes or dark yellow also sometimes. Smoky or red colored or red brown color is because of hematuria. Hematuria is presence of RBCs in the urine. Cola color is because of hemoglobin, because of intravascular hemorrhoids. Yellow brown or yellowish is because of bilirubin. Orange brown is because of urobilin and dark color on standing is because of alkaptonuria that is homogentesic acid and milky color or a kind of purulent thing is because of pus or chyle. Chyle is presence of chyle in the urine is called as chyluria. Next comes to comes to transparency or clarity of the urine. Normally urine is very clear or clean. Presence of pus or mucus or phosphates, crystals, blood or bacteria or cells will give turbidity or aziness or cloudiness to the urine. Normally fresh urine does not have any particular smell or odor, but there may be some characteristic aromatic odor. The odor may change depending on the compound excreted sometimes. For example, urine may, may have a kind of sweety odor or fruity odor. This is because of keto ketonuria like acetone or it could have an ammonical odor because of bacterial decomposition which will break the urea into ammonia by producing urease or mousy odor because of phenyl ketonuria, phenyl anion being excreted or phenyl pyruvic acid being excreted or it could be very putrid or foul smelling because of anaerobic urinary tract infection. Reaction of urine. Normally urine is slightly acidic somewhere between 6 to 6.5. As it stands if you let the urine stand it starts becoming alkaline. Now to test the reactive pattern of urine or reactive reaction of urine that is whether it is basic or alkaline. The technique is best used by best done by using lit litmus paper. The technique is best done by using litmus paper either blue or red with a good pH range between 5 to 8 like that. You know that alkaline urine turns red litmus to blue and acid urine turns blue litmus to red. Based on that you can analyze and you, you have a standard chart to compare the amount of color with the degree of pH. Causes of alkaline urine are infection with urea fermenting organisms so it will break the urea to release ammonia leading on to alkalinity. Citrates and bicarbonates also will give alkalinity, alkalinity to urine or metabolic alkalosis. Now causes for acidity is high protein diet 
which will be broken down and releasing uric acid, febrile illness, ketonuria, leukemia, ammonium chloride, mandelic acid and or ammonium mandelate. Now, as I mentioned, the method is using by using litmus strips. So, reagent strips will be impregnated with methyl red and bromothymol blue and that will show the color change also depending on the pH or you can use pH electrode. That means to say the methods of analyzing or testing the reactivity or the alkalinity or acidity of a urine sample would be by using litmus strips or reagent strips which contain specific color indicators and pH electrode. The various colors of alkalinity or acidity of urine can be seen in this particular table. Causes for alkaline urine are metabolic and respiratory alkalosis, severe vomiting, infection with ammonia producing creas, potassium deficiency, hyperaldosteronism and intake of citrus fruits, bicarbonates. Acidic urine is because of high protein diet, febrile illness, ketonuria, leukemia, starvation, severe diarrhea, diabetes mellitus and respiratory disease. Coming to specific gravity. Specific gravity is measured by a special instrument called as urinometer. This is nothing but a weighed glass cylinder with a bulb containing mercury and a stem. The stem has a graduation which ranges from 1.000 that is 1000 to 1.060, 1060. Normal range of specific gravity is 1.003 to 1.035. On an average it is 1.016. This measurement of specific gravity will give information on the renal status, concentrating ability of the urines of the kidney and hydration status of the urine. Urine total solute concentration will determine the specific gravity changes. How do you test the specific gravity? By using urinometer. Urinometer vessel, a kind of cylinder which will come with the urinometer, urinometer, it will be filled with urine. You can fill the urinometer vessel or the cylinder with three-fourths of the urine. Minimum volume required would be around 15 ml. Then the urinometer tube is inserted with a spinning motion. See to it that it does not touch the sides of the vessel or the cylinder and it does not and it nicely spins and also it does not it always floats. See to it that it does not touch the sides that is most important and it remains float, floated. Reading is taken at the meniscus at the eye level and whatever reading suppose if the urine level is at particularly 1.020 you can give it as a specificity of 1.020 but remember this particular instrument will be calibrated at 15 degree centigrade. So, in case the room temperature is above 15 degree centigrade, then you may have to do certain corrections for the temperature. For every 3 degree rise in temperature, you have to add 0 0.001 to the value. For every 3 degree below the 15 degree centigrade, you have to add point, you have to add 0 0.001. For example, we will take an example. Suppose if your room temperature is 30 degree centigrade. That means it is 3 into 5, 15 degree centigrade more than the, the actual standard 15 degree centigrade. So, you have to, you have to add 0 0.005 that is 3 into 5 is 15. So, you have to add 0 0.005 to the actual reading. Now, substances which influence specific gravity are urea, sodium chloride, phosphates, albumin and sugar. Causes for low specific gravity. When the specific gravity is less than 1.003, it is called as hyposthenuria. The causes is highly diluted urine, like diabetes insipidus and increased fluid intake, polyurias. Specific gravity is referred to as increased when it is more than 1.030, hyperasthenuric urine or hyperasthenuria. So, above 1.030, it is referred to as high specific gravity. The causes being presence of certain chemicals, certain compounds in the urine, for example, diabetes mellitus, nephrotic syndrome because of proteins and restricted, restricted fluid intake. In short, polyuria will lead to low specific gravity, oliguria will re, lead, lead to hyper or increased specific gravity. Sometimes specific gravity will be fixed at one particular level, for example, it may be fixed at 1.010 at most of the situations. This is called as urine of fixed specific gravity or isosthenuria. The best example is chronic renal disease which will lead to end stage renal disease or chronic renal failure. The best example for isosthenuria is end stage renal disease. If the urine sample is very less, what are the other methods of testing the specific gravity? It would be refractometer and reagent strip method. 
Now coming to chemical examination, what are the chemicals which you are going to test by, by chemical examination method of the urine? The important chemicals are proteins, sugar, ketone bodies, hemoglobin, myoglobin and blood, bilirubin, urobilinogen and some other miscellaneous substances. We will take up each one of these. First is protein. Normally protein is excreted in traces, very minimal, maximum being less than 150 milligrams per day. Most of the times it is less than 30 or 40 milligrams per day. Sometimes due to some physiological variations, there can be protein eater. For example, severe dehydration, exercise, cold exposure and a special thing called as orthostatic postural protein eater, wherein protein will be there only when the patient is walking around or standing, which I will explain to you a little while later. What are the tests you can do to test for proteins? They are heat and acetic acid test, LS test, sulfur salicylic acid test, dipstick method. Now how to do this heat and acetic acid test? The principle is simple. If you heat a urine containing protein, if you coagulate the proteins. So heat induced coagulation of proteins is the basis for this test. The technique is fill 3 fourths of a test tube with clear urine, with urine, heat the upper one third of the column. Why should you eat the upper one third? That is only to test, get a comparison between the lower clear one and the mild change in the upper one third. Turbidity if you see, it indicates either protein, or, protein is present or phosphates are present. So, we do not know whether it is because of protein, the turbidity is because of protein or phosphates. So, what you should do? You should add 3 to 5 drops of 5 percent acetic acid. So, the turbidity persists, then it is protein, particularly albumin. If it disappears, it means it is phosphates. The turbidity must have been because of phosphates. So, dilute acetic acid will actually dissolve the phosphate. Now, coming to the other two tests that is LS test and sulfur salicylic acid test. The principle is common for both that is precipitation or denaturation of proteins by the acid. For LS nitric acid test, LS test is also called as LS nitric acid test. You use nitric acid there. For that, you can take a small test. In that test tube, take 2 to 5 ml of urine and nitric acid along the sides of the test tube. And you will see a white ring at the, at the junction of these two fluids indicating protein is present. For sulfur salicylic acid test, take 5 ml of urine and add 0.5 ml of 20 to 25 percent of aqueous solution of sulfur salicylic acid. The turbidity indicates the presence of proteins, but this can be because of variety of proteins including albumin, globulin, glycoproteins and even benzene's protein. Benzene's proteins are nothing but monoclonal light chains which light chain proteins either kappa or lambda which can be seen in multiple myeloma or a plasma cell tumor. Now, I was talking to you about turbidity. Based on the density of turbidity, you can roughly grade the amount of protein excreted. When there is no turbidity, it means negative. So, that means less than 5 milligrams must be there in the for a deciliter. If it is traces, mean very mild minimal turbidity, maybe 20 milligrams per deciliter. One place when you see vague turbidity but no granulation, that means it is 50 milligrams per deciliter. If it is two places, you will see turbidity to be forming some granules without any flocculus, flocculus bigger granules, means 200 milligrams per deciliter. Three place means turbidity with granulation and flocculus also, flocculation means 500 milligrams per deciliter, 4 plus means big, big clumps or flocules of whitish substances or precipitates, it indicates more than 1 grams per deciliter. 